high atop Caesar Rodney Square in beautiful downtown Wilmington, Delaware. We, we are, are the Podcast, Podcast Pediatricians. Pediatricians. I'm Rob Walter. And I'm Matt Gotthold. Check us out on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Podbay, and podcastpediatricians.com. It's a Sunday, almost Hanukkah, Matt. You excited? I Happy say. Hanukkah, Rob. <laughs> <laughs> and Christmas is coming up. <laughs> Yoo-hoo! What's your favorite Christmas song? Oh, it's definitely Oh Holy Night. Yeah, I started messing around. I have a new guitar. I've been messing around oh, with nice. it a little bit. It's a it's a baby Taylor, and um, my wife kindly permitted me to to get it for myself for my sixtieth birthday. So, and what's the song called? Uh, oh, 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 my favorite. Yeah, would you say uh, Oh Holy Night? Oh Holy Night, the stars are brightly shining. You know, that's beautiful. Mm-hmm. And I don't celebrate Christmas, mm-hmm. but in the like, I think my favorite it's song, a spiritual song. Well, it brings mm-hmm. some tears to me. Is mm-hmm. um, let me see if I remember it. Grandma got run over by a reindeer <laughs> coming back from our house Christmas Eve. You may think I, I would no say such that thing that's thing Santa. <laughs> that was for me and Grandpa, we believe. I, I will say there's a definite dichotomy there between that and my favorite line in you know, A Holy Night, which is, fall on your knees, oh, hear the angel voices. <laughs> yes, and not fall on your knees because you just got clocked by Santa. And that, you know, as you said before, the only good Hanukkah song is Adam Sandler's yes. Hanukkah song. <laughs> Although I have mysteriously had, I was just telling my staff last week, I've had dreidel, dreidel, dreidel stuck in my head really? for like two days. And I think it goes to my, you know, Eastern European roots. Uh, uh-huh. It's the worst game. you ever played uh-huh. dreidel? It's, no. it's a hard, the rules are horrible. I have zero horrible. interest in that. And the other Christmas song mm-hmm. I always have in my head is, and I, and I, torture my staff with this Christmas time oh, is no. here. Oh, no. The Charlie Brown <laughs> over and over on my phone. Yes. All right, lovely. so <laughs> we're going to finish <laughs> mm-hmm. our highlights from the excellent dermatology talks by Dr. Kashi Oza, um, he from NYU, that he did at Disney um, Hot Topics and here at ROI Warrington. There were great talks, great tips and pearls. And again, as always, remember, anything we get wrong is on us. Always. And certainly... Not on Dr. Oza, but first, our disclaimer. Indeed. We are sharing our own personal opinions on pediatric care. Always talk to your own pediatric caregiver about your child. Pediatric caregivers should always consult expert guidelines and consider their own community standards of care. Okay. So, Matthew, here in the end of 2022, Mm. has your practice ever been as busy as it's been maybe in the last month it's pretty crazy busy right now and uh you know because there's an awful lot out there right floating around everybody's back in amongst each other uh commiserating at schools and and social events etc and of course we have big time viruses in the in the wind yes as they call it the triple epidemic i was thinking of this like every medical thing i listen to it's like the triple epidemic but how can we (laughs) how can we ignore the triple epidemic and there's so much um, left of the winter season. I mean, it's it's only in the mid December. We're just getting started. There's there's no pediatric hospital mm-hmm. beds nationwide, which mm-hmm. uh, worsened by the fact that for decades pediatric hospital beds keep shrinking mm-hmm. because you make more money in adult hospital beds. So all these smaller yeah. um, areas, little hospitals out there, keep converting their peds to adult, and all that's left are children's hospitals and mm-hmm. ERs that kids yeah. wait in. So. Um, it's been awful, but when we say triple epidemic, COVID nineteen, influenza A, mm-hmm. I've had a couple B's, but mostly mm-hmm. A's, and obviously uh, RSV. And I guess RSV is something that people are like. What is this virus we've never yes. heard of? What is das? And all pediatricians are like, we've been talking about Dude, RSV your whole career. Right. Mm-hmm. So you've been seeing a lot. I mean, do you remember when we were training way back in the day? That at that point they were very excited about the fact that they were working on RSV vaccines. <laughs> right. Good right. God, it's been like a hundred years, right? right. I mean, and they tr- we said that last mm-hmm. episode. I think they truly are close. They say, but we've been hearing that for so long. But they truly are close. But I think a lot of different things. Obviously, it came earlier. It mm-hmm. came harder mm-hmm. for two years. The you know the two and three year olds didn't get it. Right. So um, they got it um, this year. So it all came to kind of a perfect storm. Mm-hmm. And one in 70 babies under six months of age have been hospitalized since early October. Wow. I, you've had in your practice little uh, babies hospitalized? I, we have. We've had yep. a couple. Yeah. And, but then again, Rob, you know, we have other little babies who are like two weeks old who have RSV and they don't have a fever Me, and they're sitting there grinning at you. Me too. Right? I, had a tw- mm-hmm. I had a 22-day-old, did yeah. my PCR in the office, and Absolutely. I called mom up and said, mm-hmm. who's smiling, I said, mm-hmm. 
you know, because I said to her, if it's RSV, it's not going to be the worst thing because a lot of kids, it's just a cold. Right. But still, on the phone, mm-hmm. I could tell she was, she was oh, crying. Yeah. And I'm like, listen, uh, he's fine. You call us if he's not. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we always know about RSV that if you get it when you're early, mm-hmm. there is an increase, especially severe, like hospitalized, mm-hmm. there is an increased rate of wheezing later. Yes. It does yeah. damage some of the cells, hopefully not lifelong asthma, right. but we know it can be set you up to have asthma later. Yeah, I mean, oftentimes what we end up seeing is a child who has RSV kind of early in the season, whatever the season is these days, but I, I presume it's still like the fall. You yeah, know, but it's, the that's winter. the thing. It started out in the summer it's this year. It's year round. Right? There's yeah, no, no double peaks. It's much yeah. earlier. We'll see those kids, and especially the younger ones, tend to then kind of wheeze whenever they get colds over the next year or so. And then for, for a lot of them, they never wheeze again. So so right. it's, it really seems to be one of those things that dissipates with time. And we can't say the parents, of course, everybody's always eager, like, so does my child have asthma or not? Not, right, right. And, and and we're you we we usually at least you know the folks in and in, in both of our practice I think used to be pr- usually are pretty clear that okay hey listen you've this is the third time you're wheezing I think we should probably start calling this well right so we'll right. Talk, mm-hmm. ne- our next ep- episode is mm-hmm. going to be on asthma yeah. but you know the a word so yes. for when we started the a word what asthma oh, because yes. when they hear that mm-hmm. grandma thinks oh right. he'll never be able to play again mm-hmm. he's going to be that sad kid mm-hmm. um, but. I think more and more people see Olympic athletes who use their inhaler before they play, and they know people who who it doesn't really slow them down when they're careful. Yes. The big A word now is autism, right? Yes, that's the, that's sure. the word that we have to be really careful yeah. saying in the room. Although mm-hmm. that's changing too about the way we kind of look at autism. Yeah. But so with this RSV that is. Also hitting older kids, but also because we're testing for it. If right. I'm doing my panel and has RSV in it, mm-hmm. I'll find this six-year-old has RSV where I never would have known that before, and they're not that sick. Mm-hmm. But then COVID-19, which continues, and I don't know about you, over these months when I have someone coming in with a fever and a cough who's, who's older, who I'm not thinking necessarily RSV, if they're kind of sick, I think maybe have COVID-19. If they're really sick, mm-hmm. they probably have the flu. You know, and that just knocks you down. Have you you've been seeing a ton of yeah, flu? Yeah, I, I, I agree. I largely agree. The sickest looking kids typically have the flu. You know, yeah, flu A. And um, and at least what we found, and and you guys I know are are doing some of this now too, is the capacity for us to be able to specifically diagnose what virus you have has a lot of advantages. It's not you know you're still telling people to look for the same kind of critical things at home once you send them out of the office. Are they uh, in pain? Are right. they lethargic to the point they're not interacting? You know, are they hydrated? Struggle mm-hmm. breathing. Right. Struggle breathing. I mean, the best way I know to define scr- struggled breathing, and this is after kind of like you know 30 years of of, of of sculpting my 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 spiel on this is does it look like they're using muscles they wouldn't usually use to breathe right I, their neck their shoulders their belly more deeply those kinds of things and I think that 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 speaks for itself you know the funky noises that babies make which always freak parents out you know the little trick that I tend to use with parents I'll show them is is I put my hands over my ears now look at the baby are they look do they look like they're having a hard time breathing because if they don't they're not right. Anyway, so so what we really need to do is is talk about what's out there to, to help us with these things, right? Speaking first thing about the, the flu, so we've talked about before about Tamiflu or Oseltamivir, I think. Mm-hmm. And uh, have you been uh, using it? No. So so Oseltamivir, as well as I know you know, has been around since like 1999. Right. That's when it was first it was first FDA approved in the U.S. But I just, as recently as this morning, I just tried to do a literature search. I went to up to date and a couple other things that are up to, that are that are you know good sources of information. And still continue the all the all the resources continue to say more research needs to be done on the efficacy of this in children. And and I, I'm sorry, we've been using it for 20 or it's been used now for 23 years like just decide (laughs) does it help or doesn't it help right because my 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 uh, opinion is is that more often times than not it's more trouble than it's worth right so i think i use it more than you and i'm sure you you know the gi Mm -hmm. side effects are the the um the main things Mm -hmm. i don't i don't see it that much right you know when you say risk if you have a an infant looking pretty sick with the flu Mm -hmm. they're relatively high risk so Mm -hmm. and the younger kids um and we'll think of it. And then there's other risks. Like we know they may get better, may shed letters. So if there's people in the house that are high risk. Mm-hmm. 
So I probably do um, um, do that. Obviously, you have to do it within mm-hmm. the first 48 hours. So right. if you're outside of that, it's not going to be doing that much. And if they're right. not that sick, mm-hmm. I'll talk to the parents. Some parents come in, I really would like this. And mm-hmm. if it's if it's not, if it's indicated, if they have the flu within 48 hours, um, I'm going to do it. Mm-hmm. So I think we, we do a little bit different with yeah, Tamiflu. Yeah, I think we do. And then last mm-hmm. last year, I think we talked about Zofluza, this yeah. new thing that came mm-hmm. out, one pill to help treat, also one pill to prevent and it came out during the slowest flu season in the history of the world. <laughs> so all this advertising. So this year I didn't see much about it. Yes. Um, have you used that at all? No, I've not, but I have in the past. I think the jury's still out on this one too, although I'm a little bit more um, enthusiastic about it. And that's for mm-hmm. 12 and above. So right. I used it once this season, actually, mm-hmm. for a, kind of a family member, mm-hmm. um, who uh, adult. Yes. And because we sometimes will treat... Mm-hmm. People in our realm yes, we do. who are older. Uh-huh. And um, the interesting there, thing there is like the pharmacist hadn't heard of it. Nobody had it. Wow. So it's one of the things that we're used to. Like if you have mm-hmm. a drug they're not used much, mm-hmm. look to the tiny ones. So yes. we finally found it in a supermarket oh boy. pharmacy. Because and I talked to the pharmacist. He said, Zofluza. And he like, he rummaged around and probably looked in a drawer and said, I have three of them, but not, never open. It's I next said, to okay, the rubber bands. We'll, we'll take yeah. those three, right? <laughs> so, you know, it's just so interesting there, you know, because yeah. CVS. And mm-hmm. all the right age, they were they were done. Right. Um, well, whenever my, well, you know, whenever I, my kids ask me, we've talked about this before. Like, why is something the way it is? You know, my very first kind of like skeptical answer is is like follow the money, right? And so Tamiflu is available pretty broadly now for like fifteen bucks, right? right. So flus is like I just checked this morning, one hundred and eighty bucks. Right. Well, it's mm-hmm. like eighty if you have yeah, relatively if you, if you good do. insurance. If right. you do, right. but nonetheless, I, I think there's more promise with that. Look at us. We're talking about the viruses and things. And mm-hmm. what are we not talking about, really? Yes. It's COVID-19. Yes. Um, and there has been a, a decrease, although we're worried about the winter coming and the, all the rules have relaxed. So I haven't been really hearing about MISC um, cases right. very much. And those, again, are an older, so not the youngest ones. Um, I think both of us said last time the six-month-old to five-year-olds really is a tough discussion and most of our families are not choosing to do that yeah. um, but uh, we do bring it up but we're not pushing yeah like we did and got people upset a couple years ago yeah yeah no it's it's funny I, I don't know if this is going to be a sleeping giant for us right like you know all of a sudden now we're not paying so much attention to it and we haven't been advocating for this and that, and like you I mean my my response usually when a parent asks me about their younger child and 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 immunizing them against COVID, my, my my response is, I think it's very reasonable. Like, that's my response, right? right? Uh, right. Whereas if they ask me about measles, I'm like, hell yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh-huh. So, so yeah, I, 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 I hope we just haven't become too numb to it. Right. And the other mm-hmm. thing, when you have a lot of respiratory viruses and a lot of thick mucus, is it tends to lead to other things that actually are bacterial. So mm-hmm. the main one for us, obviously, is ear infections. And while two years ago we were both talking about we'd never see an ear infection anymore, <laughs> and then there's been a now a ton yes. of ear infections, yes. a ton of ear infections, and thick's not coming out. So all of that's happening at the same time, which is probably the most memorable be- thing for me um, in the office, at least, late summer and fall, is that there's an amoxicillin shortage. Do you remember like when it first started happening? I think it was CVS where like mm-hmm. blah, 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 amoxicillin. All of a sudden you get a message or a parent calls, they're out of it. Mm-hmm. Like you're out of amoxicillin? Yes. yes. And then we tried another one. And then, mm-hmm. and then Walgreens got out of it. And then you're like, oh, okay, alternatives, Augmentin, you don't want to go so broad, mm-hmm. Omnicef. Mm-hmm. I mean- Mm-hmm. And then other things uh, started uh, um, becoming <sighs> short too. Yeah. Adderall and Concerta, mm-hmm. um, which I don't, as I said before, I'm not a big Adderall yeah. fan. But that was an issue. And then if it, the, and then all these places are saying that well, you can only do the brand name and not the and not the generic, which is ridiculous. Yes. So you're dealing with that, and then all these phone calls. Mm-hmm. We can't. It's not the right. We need a new pharmacy. We need a new pharmacy. It's just. Mm-hmm. And I know it's supply chain issues, but it's been pretty maddening. Yeah, but why, right? I mean, I, I mean, it's not like amoxicillin is hard to make, right? You know why it is? Because it doesn't. I, I'll bet you, if this was some, you know, oh, right. three hundred dollar drug, there would be no shortage of it, would there? Right. Yeah. So, so, but it's it's really it's it's irritating. You know, number one, I think that um, 
the whole system in terms of how we prescribe and then how um, the feedback that we get in terms of something not being available is just miserably broken, right? I mean, we prescribe something, we send it electronically to the pharmacy, right. which is so much more efficient than the old writing it down, right? right? And then the pharmacy, the parent goes to pick it up, assuming the best. The pharmacy doesn't have it. So that engenders about six more phone calls back and forth, right? right. As opposed to like, look, pharmacy on Main Street, why don't you just either send us a fax or send us a an electronic message in the morning saying like we have no amoxicillin today right exactly. like that would make a lot more right. sense right right but but that kind of that kind of frustration is so common in our prescribing you know right between that and what's on a formula and what isn't on a formula and what right. needs prior authorization which most of the time just means i want this drug for sure right as opposed right. to saying anything else. it's really just you know i i see it as either it's incredibly like foolish and, and, and undisciplined, or it's it's part of a whole kind of like subculture of, well, if it's too hard to get, then, uh, you know, we don't have to pay for it. Right. And then it also encourages mm -hmm. practitioners to sometimes be less than forthright about what they're doing. It's yes. like, well, you can't have this this cream unless you've tried these three other ones. Mm -hmm. And like, you're like, oh, fine, I did. I'll sign it. I did. Right. You know, then you're like, am I lying? They're going to arrest yeah. me mm -hmm. sometimes. I mean, please, I don't do that too much. No. But like, it makes us like, you know, you know they need the medication mm -hmm. and it's not fitting what their guidelines are. So do we mm -hmm. prescribe something and yeah. waste it because we know it won't work so we can then prescribe something else? Right. So right. Yeah. Because I think we both feel very much in, and, and, and sincerely the same way. We work for our patients. Like, we don't work for anybody else. Right. I don't work for the pharmaceutical industry or the hospitals or anybody. I work for you, my patient, right? right? And it's just, oh, it's aggravating. Right. It, it mm -hmm. is, it is. And then during all these infectious things, I mean, a lot of the pressure, especially in the hospitals, go to the infectious disease specialists yes. who, we say that, you know, we work for our patients, but a lot of them work for us for free every day answering our questions mm -hmm. and they've been dumped upon during the COVID-19. They're so kind, kind they're so patient, them. you know, and when we get to the fact that they are uh, really some of the most valuable people in our communities and they've really been unfairly battered during this pandemic. Um, you know, so many, so much so that the infectious disease training slots uh, aren't, aren't being filled. Right. That's a, that's always that's always a red flag. Right. Like what's going on here? Because these are people who are urgently needed. They are, are a marvelous resource, especially for those of us in primary care. And it looks like maybe we won't be able to have enough of them in the in the near future. It, it's mm -hmm. it's it's frightening. I mean, just like last week, just randomly last week, ER report came of a teenage uh, patient who had pyelonephritis, which is a kidney infection. Mm -hmm. Wasn't that sick? And then they send a culture. They put them on cephalexin, keflex, which is which is reasonable for the usual E. coli's. And then it came back with a coag negative staph, staph saprophyticus. So of course I went on to up to date and I said, is this really a bug? And yes, it can be in teenage girls. But when you have that bug, that's not usually a pathogen. They don't do sensitivities. They don't look and see what bugs will kill it because it's not a usual pathogen. And I was like, well, would Keflex work? And up to date was not helping me there. <laughs> so I called our local uh, infectious disease. We have four wonderful ones here at uh, the Moore's Children's. And, uh, and even then, there was not a lot of literature, but she dealt with this before. She said, oh, yes, I've dealt with it before. I would do this. And so I changed the medication. It's one of those things we'll never know if that mm -hmm. made any difference because we're yeah. all about prevention. Mm -hmm. But now I had this person on a better medication that I wouldn't have known about if I didn't have a free consult yes. from infectious disease. So, yeah, we salute them. And it's scary to think that there won't be as many of them. I would think, if anything, more people would go into it if we need them right. more. Right. And, and, we, and we as pediatricians have always been considered kind of junior ID people because so much of what we deal with is infectious disease. That in dermatology, right? right? So the fact that we need them so so um, you know so badly uh, is really because it's upper level stuff that we don't deal with that we have to tap into their big brains about. Yeah. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And you know, one other thing we've been talking the whole uh, pandemic about the mental health explosion and how much of our practice is now um, treating um, kids with mental health issues, including prescribing as needed and as we are comfortable. But I don't know about you, but I've been seeing a lot more of college kids, yeah. first and second year college who are really struggling. And you have to go back to, you know, being in lockdown during high school during the formative socialization um, times for their brain. And then they go to college 
and they're not ready. And yeah. it's, I don't know about you, I, I know informally, I bet we're going to see literature on this, that the uptick of um, self-injury uh, thoughts and even suicides in college and, and attempts uh, are rising. Mm-hmm. And are going to. Yeah, it's easily to isolate yourself at college, right? I mean, you're there with 20,000 other people. You have a roommate. But aside from that, I mean, I've had at least one or two of my patients who essentially like went into deep depression, didn't come out of their rooms, like weren't brushing their teeth or showering or anything like that. But nobody knew. Right. Like they, they, they may speak to their parents once a week. How, how's it going? Good. If they have mm-hmm. a good RA, maybe. Yes. Yes. But that's not always the case. That's not always the and case. And someone is like, you know, nobody in the school is like checking up on them. Mm-hmm. So, and they're probably saying the parents, everything's great. Mm-hmm. Everything's great. So, yeah. So, yeah, we're definitely still seeing the repercussions and will continue to be. But, the, you know, this since this is likely our last episode for 2022, we really can't end, the, end this year without commenting on one of the most significant and pathetic and scary trends seen in pediatric health this, this year in America. And that is the fact that firearm deaths are now the number number one killer of children under the age of 19. Wow. This is not a worldwide trend, at least not nearly to the same extreme. When comparing the U.S. to other large, wealthy nations, the U.S. has 46% of children in that group, but has 97% of child gun deaths. This is appalling, right? And it's not a coincidence. 97 percent mm-hmm. yeah. 90 oh well yeah. child gun deaths uh-huh. in these and these wealthy nations are, are in our country good god um, you know yeah. i always have these like seven key questions i like to ask mm-hmm. about teens and one of them is always what's the number of way that te- number one way that teenagers die and it always started out to be car crashes and more recently we talk about death by suicide but now really if you look at it it's gun violence including gun homicides suicides and much less commonly accidental firings causing death. Yeah, I mean, you know, throughout recorded human history, prior to the advent of modern medicine, the source of most child, most childhood deaths was disease, you know, particularly infectious diseases as we were just talking about, right? However, by the time Rob and I were growing up in the 1960s, yes, we're that old, the major cause of childhood death, at least in the U.S., was car crashes. 20 years ago, there were three times more pediatric deaths caused by automobile accidents than there were from guns. Gun-related deaths started to increase about 10 years ago, and and now gun deaths are the number one source of death in children, with more than five gun-related deaths per 100,000 children under 19 in our country. Last year alone, 3,587 children died from gun violence, with two-thirds of these deaths coming from homicides, and the other roughly one-third of these deaths coming from suicides. It's not a coincidence that these deaths were very disproportionately in children of color, especially black children, and most especially black boys, especially by homicide. In general, as it relates to childhood deaths by firearms, black children will usually be killed by another person, whereas firearm deaths among white children were more commonly by suicide. And obviously, guns are a hot button item in our society. And I don't know about you, I usually only asked about guns in the house if there are some mood issues. I used to ask more. I'd gotten away from routinely asking about guns in the house, but now I've started to ask about it again at well visits. And, you know, making clear it's not a Second Amendment issue, but for me as a pediatrician, it's a safety issue. And obviously, at least if they have them, they should be stored safely. And if there's any mood issues, get them out of the house. Give them to a friend. And, and that is a, a discussion that I'll be happy to go toe-to-toe with a parent about. But the problem really nationwide is there's just so many guns. We're washing guns, especially handguns in our community. And, you know, and we try not to get very political here. We understand there are complex socioeconomic factors in play. But we as a nation are such an outlier on pediatric gun deaths. I mean, we can't even outlaw assault weapons. Uh, it's just so. And so what about you? Do you bring up uh, guns in the house? Uh, you know what? I should do it more. I definitely should do it more, especially because one of our offices is in an area where we know that there is a lot of there are a lot of people who hunt and a lot of people who have guns in their home. And um, and honestly, I think that at least I I can't speak for my partners have been remiss with this, you know, right. especially looking at these newer you know this right. information. It, it took looking at this information number one to to knock us like we got we got to address mm-hmm. this a little bit more, you know. And in speaking of that, there has been a few high profile cases that. It's been pretty controversial. There's one in Illinois now where they're charging the parents of young adults over 
you know, 18 or above, so adults, in connection with uh, gun violence that their child uh, perpetrated. And uh, honestly, in, we hear about some of these situations where the police have been called to the house because the child is threatening to kill a lot of people. And then you find after that, the parent either buys or signs off on a gun for that person, right. and he goes out and kills people. I think they have responsibility for that. <laughs> you bet. Don't you? I mean, who- You know, Jenny, the cops are just here because Michael's saying that he's going to kill people. Maybe we should get him his gun. For Christmas. Uh, for right. Christmas. Uh-huh. You know, and, and they know their child. A social worker comes in. Uh, a police officer comes in. I mean, they don't really, can't really know that much. And so I think that... Uh, it's, we'll see how it plays out, but there's got to be some parental responsibility if they actually facilitate having a gun when it's clear that they themselves are scared about their child's possibility of hurting people. Yeah, and I, and I think I can I can speak for Rob and certainly for a lot of our, our, our peers as pediatricians. This is a complicated, but it's an important topic that needs to be viewed through the lens of health of children and not of our society all the time. Right. There are absolutely things that can be legislated that would lower this number without causing a major disruption in what are perceived by many people as their basic rights. Right. Yeah. Uh, there's there's common sense. And lastly, before the break, we do have to acknowledge that our Philadelphia Phillies Woo! made it to the World <laughs> Series. <laughs> Woo! All right. Wow. It was it was like 1993, man. Like you know, just a bunch of dudes, you know, who all of a sudden coalesced at the end of the year, right? Was that mm-hmm. center fielder, the guy who never washed his hair? Uh, oh yeah. I, I'm not gonna trash that dude <laughs> with a name. It looked I'll, like I'll it. Get sued, man. <laughs> we all know who he was. We loved <laughs> him. We loved him. But I got to I got uh-huh. to go to um, the good game, game three of the World Series, <laughs> when uh, um, uh. Bryce Harper started out with a bomb uh-huh. and they seven nothing. Oh, and man. I was in my car the next day. It was a Wednesday driving mm-hmm. and WIP Philly sports station and they the discussion was what day should they have the parade <laughs> for the World <laughs> Series championship in my head I'm going no don't I mean, you do it Astros are oh, still a better team oh, and they were. that uh-huh. night they went out and not only beat the Phillies mm-hmm. historically yes. sh- um, no hit yeah. the Phillies it, you know first time oh. since 1956 which mm-hmm. as I've said uh, Matt was at that game in 1956 <laughs> uh, Don Larson's what, perfect then. game yeah, right. Uh-huh. <laughs> no, I felt really badly for my brother because my brother Dennis, you know, good dude, one of my very best, you know, very best and closest, you know, folks in my life, had very kindly gotten me tickets for he and I to go to see Bono up in, up in New York City for uh, for a one man show. Right. And so it was scheduled for the same night that one of the World Series games was scheduled for. Um, and uh, and then the rain delay. Right. So it got pushed back a day, and Dennis had already committed to a friend to, to go to the, the the World Series game. So he had he, there was an open ticket for Bono, and I told. But that was the game that Dennis attended, where they got slammed. <laughs> <laughs> so it was like wrong choice on my part, oh, the, there, man. The, the no hit. Uh-huh. How was uh, Bono? Uh, uh, it, it was good, That's and nice. and the place was packed. I mean, uh, there were some dignitaries there. I mean, of course, I kid you not, Diane and I are literally in the last row of the Beacon Theater. <laughs> um, and uh, and up front, though, I think we're. Uh, uh, I think it was. Uh, Bill and Hillary Clinton and uh, and some wow. other other dignitaries wow. and so it was well attended and that sounds great. What I'm looking forward to is I'm going to see the epic musical failure of Stephen Sondheim, which I know you're a huge Sondheim <laughs> fan. Merrily We Roll Along, which has bombed every time, but there's new production <laughs> with Jonathan Groff and Harry Potter. Uh, Daniel Radcliffe. Ah, okay. uh, in, uh, I'm going in the first week of January, so I'll let you know it's sold out, but it's coming to Broadway. Merrily we roll along, Matt. Uh, you yeah. won't go to it. No, no. no I, right. I like to think about merrily we roll along more, at, more in in context of you and me. Okay, you know, merrily we roll along, <laughs> Rob. Uh huh. Clearly, you have different tastes in our entertainment <laughs> worlds, but uh, yeah, different musical tastes. But the one thing that we agree on is those Philadelphia Eagles. Oh, yeah, man. Mm. Oh man. Uh, I'm gonna save savor this season. I hope I hope kind of to the end point here. So uh, so big game with those hated Cowboys coming up, right? Uh, Christmas Eve. I know, like a trap mm-hmm. game, right? Before uh, this, the Bears. Before today, today yeah. the Bears. We have to get through the Bear game. Mm-hmm. And aren't you like any Eagles fan where you're just waiting for something terrible to happen? Oh, always. Like every just, game, like someone's gonna get hurt. I mean, the, it the hangs punter over got your head hurt. like the, a Sith, right? I know. I don't know if other 
uh, other fans are like that. Mm-hmm. Maybe all are in some ways. Certainly, like <laughs> Jet fans are because it always happens. <laughs> right. But um, but I just keep worrying about it. But uh, fingers crossed. If they do go, I know we're not supposed to jinx things, but if they do go to Arizona, mm-hmm. would you go? It would depend. It would depend on a lot of things. I think. Yeah, I mean, I've been to one Super Bowl, and as as, as you know, I, they lost that one. And then uh, you you were to the big victory one, right? Yes, mm-hmm. in the freezing cold in Minnesota. So, <laughs> but it was it was it was great. It was great. So we'll have to see. So if maybe either, we'll see. If but one game at a time, one game at a time. Yes, Jalen. I love Hurst. our coach one game too, at a time. and okay. our QB. Yes. Yep. All right, ready? Ready. Fly, fly Eagles, fly on the road to victory. Fight, fight Eagles, fight. fight. Scoring Throw touchdowns, touchdowns, one, two, one, two, three. Hit them low, hit them high. And watch our eagles fly, fly, eagles fly. On the road to victory, E-A-G-L-E-S, eagles. Okay, we'll be back after the break with Dermatopalooza 2. Don't go away. Let's dive right back in. So Dr. Oza gave us a bunch of dermatology tips and tricks. He spoke initially on the topic of infant hemangiomas. There's a great infantile hemangioma referral score, or IHR res, yes, that you can Google. And you'll just see the link to the scoring sheet. Yeah, scoring sheet. Help you decide mm-hmm. if a baby with hemangioma should go to dermatology, maybe get oral propranolol. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I keep it on my, my cart now. You have a cart? Uh, I have a cart. You're an old man. <laughs> keep it on Do you my keep it cart. next to your cane and your walker? <laughs> Maybe. Nice. Maybe. Uh-huh. Are, are, you, are, you, are, you, are you shaming me because I need some help, Matthew? Beverly, where are the prunes? <laughs> <laughs> so using this algorithm on the scoring sheet, you're encouraged to refer any hemangiomas that have any complications like ulcerations, visual compromise, certainly near the eye, feeding difficulties or strida, or strider, plus any hemangiomas of the central face or of the ears or of the breasts in females. It also suggests referral for any midline lumbar sacral hemangiomas, and obviously often we'll do ultrasounds mm-hmm. for those to look at the spine, and any hemangiomas greater than four centimeters. And if there's five or more, remember if there's five or more, you also end up doing an ultrasound of the liver to look for any liver hemangiomas. Yep. The point is... This can help us with appropriate early referral to avoid problems later. And as we mentioned a few years ago on our dermatology episode, pediatric dermatologists continue to encourage us primary pediatric caregivers to consider prescribing topical treatment with timolol malleolate 0.5% ophthalmic gel forming solution. The parent puts it on their fingertip and puts it on the hemangioma twice a day for superficial hemangiomas that are less than one millimeter thick. It helps decrease the growth, and it works towards a better cosmetic outcome. So these aren't at the high-risk areas, but as we know, hemangiomas get bigger in the first year and then involute, but often not completely, and you get that weird skin where they used to have an hemangioma. So this can help avoid it. You can't use it if the hemangioma is very thick or if it's deeply subcutaneous, and can be used until about 9 to 12 months of age, starting as early as possible. So I've gotten my partners in my office to do this more. How about you? Have you done this a little, or had your partners do it? Yeah, no, I have done it a little. I I honestly am not sure if my partners have done it or not. I know we've talked about it a little bit, but it really seems like... um you know, no lose situation. You know, it can certainly improve things. The way that Rob and I used to practice many years ago when we started was, you know, just leave them alone. Um, I think the rule of thumb was 50% of them go away by the time they're five, 90% by the time they're nine. But you're right, Rob. I mean, oftentimes it will leave this little stippling of the skin that, you know, even if most people can't see it, you know, it's there. Right. So, right. so if you can, if you can avoid that, it's easy. Mm-hmm. Why not? Indeed. All right. So next, Dr. Oza discussed hair loss and specifically the approach to bald patches, differentiating between alopecia areata, which is an autoimmune condition, versus trichotillomania. In alopecia areata, the hairs that remain are of equal length and are easy to pull out. With a pull test, the hairs have exclamation point ends. So what that means is the hair is thicker at the ends than at the base near the scalp. And there's sometimes symmetric nail pitting. 
In trichotillomania, which is hair pulling, there are hairs in the area of concern that are not easy to pull out and have unequal length and blunt and frayed ends. Nail pitting is not seen. So alopecia areata treatment can start with steroid injections to the site by a dermatologist. We don't, we don't touch those things, right? Nope. And, and topical That's minoxidil and, prog- and then progress to systemic biologicals. There they are again. So trichotillomania or hair pulling, and for that matter, dermatotillomania or skin picking. Don't you love that name, dermatotillomania? Uh, you I never heard I that before. I love the fact that I can say it. Yeah. <laughs> After many years of practice. Uh, neither one of these has FDA-approved treatments. Kids with these conditions are also often very bright and driven kids. They're more likely to be female, and the condition can be worsened by anxiety, although it's not simply a consequence of anxiety or of OCD. You know, these things are kind of intermeshed. And people, so, people mm-hmm. just don't understand them, as no. I said. They're not well understood. No. They need to do more studies on exactly. it. Exactly. So skin picking is not considered a form of self-injury like cutting is. Both trichotillomania and dermatotillomania tend to start around puberty, and both can worsen when the child's taking stimulant meds for ADHD, and the conditions coexist about 20% of the time. Management of these disorders is difficult and can include cognitive behavioral therapy and habit reversal therapy if a qualified therapist can be found, Yeah, which is always a challenge, right? Journaling and a technique called claws to pause, which involves making a fist and pushing down at the top of your thumb, can be found to be helpful. Sometimes meds like SSRIs or naltrexone are used. But, and this is something I didn't know, the initial treatment of choice for skin picking, hair pulling, is N-acetylcysteine, an over-the-counter vitamin supplement. Doses start at 1,200 milligrams and go up to 2,400 milligrams per day. Have you tried this? Maddie, I, I have not yet. I'm waiting for the appropriate candidate. I probably see skin picking more than I see trichotillomania. So funny you should ask, Rob, because literally three days ago, oh, I just said that literally thing I'm always trashing my kids for. So, so, so three days ago, I had a patient in the office. He is taking a stimulant med, delightful young man, who also tends to pick at his fingers in particular. And we know that that can sometimes be associated you know, with, um, with the taking of stimulant meds. And his mom, who's a really sweet and bright lady, who's also a nurse, I pitched this to her. I said, you know what? Let's let's give this a shot if you're okay right. with it. And usually the studies that have been done, mostly on adults, have been 1,200 to 2,400 milligrams. But the few things that I could find in the literature about kids suggested that if you were going to try it, which apparently is is very safe, there haven't been any you know reports of otherwise, you would start more like in the 300 to 600 hmm. milligrams. And so so... We looked up. We 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 went online uh, to a to a, a certain manufacturer. It was referenced, and uh, for eleven bucks, you get a hundred six hundred mm. milligram capsules. Wow! So we'll see. Stay Let tuned. Let me know. Yeah. Let me stay know. tuned. And the next topic is warts, the bane of our existence. Sometimes mm. warts and the parents' existence. Doctor Oza described warts or veruca, as in veruca salt from Charlie and Chocolate Factory. Remember her. I, I do. Her uh, father was movie. loaded, and I he loved had, that uh-huh. movie. Veruca, the squirrels yeah, mm-hmm. is the bane of existence. Uh, as he said, the bane of all pediatric dermatology existence. Remember, sixty-six percent will resolve within two years of onset. Eighty percent will go away within four years. Topical salicylic acid has been found to have a modest benefit over placebo. Cryotherapy freezing is probably just as effective, although it may be better for hand warts. Do you freeze warts in your office, Maddie? No, I think we talked about this back when we had discussed right. some dermatology things before, and I just we just didn't have a good experience. Right. I, th- I think that people expect freezing right. to uh, to eliminate the warts right away, right. Uh, and it's a process. Right. We we do use this Veruca Freeze, and we have no mm-hmm. commercial connection with them. Um, I like to use it with the cones, mm-hmm. not not with the Q-tips, but actually you put a little cone on it, and so you can really Spray get a nice it directed, yeah. ice ball, and then follow that up with salicylic acid. But again, and it's not as cold as a dermatologist mm-hmm. using liquid nitrogen, but that's a nightmare to have in your yeah. office, so we don't do that. While we're on this topic, just for a second, do you uh, treat molluscum at all? Hey, that's another one. So mm-hmm. I, tr- I often don't. If I do treat molluscum, mm-hmm. we talked about I use podophyllin. You do. Okay. And with a in the office? flat toothpick. No, mm-hmm. no, no, no. Mm-hmm. I prescribe it, and I have a handout, and they just touch it with the podophyllin, mm-hmm. and they moisturize around it, make sure it dries, mm-hmm. do it at night. It causes an inflammatory reaction. Yes. And it's kind of magical. If you, if, even if you do a couple of them and they mm-hmm. get inflamed, then mm-hmm. often the rest of them will go away. 
Yeah. How yeah. about you? I've done both. So so uh, I think I, I may be the only doc in our practice who's who's willing to put his license on the line and do this. But um, I will use cantharidin, so okay. you know, Beetlejuice. So it's a blistering agent. Do you have it in the office? Mm-hmm. We do. Yeah. Okay. And uh, and I'll put essentially a cuff of uh, some type of an ointment, usually either Vaseline or uh, or um, you know Bacitracin or something right. around the lesion, and then very carefully just you know put a drop or two on. And I'll usually gotcha. yeah, I'll do anywhere from one to like five lesions. Gotcha. Uh, and generally the parents are really happy and we have had good success but you do I mean we usually just try to talk them out of it uh, <laughs> but some parents are really right. insistent that they want it done right so uh, okay well uh, for, fear, for fearful kids speaking of blistering agents Dr. Oza will use salicylic acid and then cover the wart with duct tape nightly it can take weeks and he says not to stop this process until the site's smooth if there are numerous warts one can try oral zinc at a dose of 10 milligrams per kilo per day, or oral cimetidine, uh, also known as, say it, Rob, Tagamet. Tagamet. Yes, Yay. flashback there. At 40 milligrams per kilo per day, divided TID, but results are not very robust. So have you tried any of these things, man? You know, I, I think back in the day when I had some of the lots and lots yeah. of warts, I did the cimetidine. Yeah, yeah. And I remember one person seemed to work, but they get better anyway. So Same. I, I it's, Same. I was, his yeah. studies showed that that doesn't really help. Yeah. His big pearl here was something called wart peel. Have, have, have you ever heard of that, Rob? I had not. Had you mm-hmm. heard of that? I had not. So wart peel is apparently compounded salicylic acid, 17%, and 5-FU. And you can get it compounded what by a What did you just say to me? <laughs> <laughs> you heard me. Five F U. Nice. You can get that compounded by the pharmacy. It's applied at night and covered with occlusive tape. It's often not covered by insurance. He says it costs about eighty bucks, and it's his first go-to for plantar warts, the tough, thicker ones, and also periungual warts, which are really tough. Those, Those are warts really tough. around the nail bed that I usually send to dermatology. As a reminder, and I think both of us do this, if you have those flat warts like on the face, often we just do nothing. But if yes. you're going to do something, you can use topical Retin-A, mm-hmm. Tretinoin, which is what we use for acne. Yeah, yeah. So Dr. Uh, Oza also discussed periorificial dermatitis, which Rob and I, I think, knew during our training as perioral dermatitis. Right. But uh, it was always a little bit of an awkward term because it also can occur around the eyes. But anyway, so this is, this is a, uh, 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 these are lesions, you know, small red lesions, usually seen around the mouth, that can also affect air, an area near the eye. And the key to diagnosing this is that it spares the area that's adjacent to the lip, which is known as the vermilion border. This rash is often caused by the use of topical steroids at these areas. It doesn't have to be caused by that, but it can be. And sometimes even by the use of inhaled steroids or nasal steroids due to the area's ongoing exposure to them. So this is a case where the steroid actually creates the rash, which right. is kind of crazy, right? And, and mm-hmm. as people know, when we don't know what a rash is, like, hey, why don't you try to put Heck a little yeah. steroid on But in this mm-hmm. case... It yeah. makes it worse, yeah, and it causes yeah. it. Yeah, and it can also be triggered by fluoridated toothpaste and sometimes even by certain moisturizers. So I got this about six months ago. I was getting this. It's a reddish, dryish area around my chin, near my nose. Very annoying. So what did I do? Like any other self-respecting pediatrician, <laughs> I tried topical steroids. And I'm like, and I'm like looking at it every day, like this doesn't seem to be getting better. <laughs> you know, people were noticing it. Um, and then I, I, I looked it up a little bit, and I thought, ah. Oh, that's what it probably has. And probably was a combination of nasal steroids that I use and also toothpaste. You know, I have this electric toothpaste and it drips out around. I'm like, that's exactly where I was getting the rash. And what cured it, and I looked it up on Up to Date. We don't really talk about Up to Date a lot. I was talking no, to a great OBGYN source. the other day. Mm-hmm. He's like, he just looks up everything and mm-hmm. things. So I think like med- medical people around the country are just using Up to Date yeah. and it's good. And what cured it was pomicrolimus, that Elidil, that expensive stuff. Mm-hmm. I prescribed it for myself, $350. <laughs> Holy I went, moly. I went to a different pharmacist. She said, wait a minute, I'll call you back. And she found it for like 80 bucks. Oh, nice. That's the crazy thing, right? It's all these stupid dermatology rules. You can find and something. Dermatology meds are so ridiculous. But anyway, so expensive. I put that on. I'm more careful with my daily Flonase. And in terms of the uh, toothpaste, I just never brush my teeth anymore. <laughs> I thought there was something different about you. <laughs> Let me just say, that's not true. I brush them at least twice a day. I knew you'd have to But I make sure that it stays that. in uh, my mouth. I have used the microlimus on a few kids with periorificial dermatitis yeah. when nothing else worked. And it did work great if we can yeah. get it 
paid for it. Have you used other things as well? I mean, because traditionally over the years, I've tried everything from some mupirocin, you know, so so bactroban to, I know that one of the local pediatric dermatologists suggest, had suggested that we try metronidazole gel and or clindamycin. Oh, if you look on up to date, solution. it also yeah. talks about taking oral yeah. Um, yeah, antibiotics for weeks and right. weeks and weeks. So I saw it, I'm like, I mm-hmm. don't want to do Which that. Which again, is we're treating, we don't know what we're treating here. Right. Right? Right. So, uh, but, but the dilemma with a lot of the topical um, uh, antibiotics were it was going to be four to six weeks to work if it was going to work. Right. Right. So right. it was a, it was a little bit. So um, I, I still say mm-hmm. avoid those things if you can, and then if yeah. you can get it covered, try the uh, permicrolimus elidol. Yeah. Now, if the red scaly rash or a red rash does go into the vermilion border right up to the lips, then it's probably appropriate for us as pediatricians to think about lip lickers dermatitis. Lip lickers. A lot of lip lickers. Okay. It's amazing how many kids lick their lips. And, and of course, it sort of perpetuates itself, right? So my lips are dry, so I lick them. So then I get these sores, and that makes me want to lick, <laughs> lick them, them, right? <laughs> uh-huh. um, so here you can use thick, thick emollients like Vaseline or Aquaphor, and sometimes even consider a little bit of two and a half percent hydrocortisone or one of the non-steroidals like permicrolamus see rob for that but mostly get them to stop licking their lips which again is hard it's like not biting your nails right when you're a nail biter right often much easier said than done especially in the winter okay i have two words for you matt bliss and patigo ah! so Cashy then showed what he called one sec second rash diagnoses and he showed bullis and Batigo and showed a study that like the majority of experienced pediatric clinicians always miss this it presents with three to five centimeters so really sometimes really big um, round lesions with crusting and peeling collarettes on the outside no systemic symptoms at all sometimes some erosions and vesicles it's caused by a staph toxin and it's treated with oral antibiotics like cephalexin or keflex. And don't you know, meeting ended Sunday, Monday, halfway through the morning, a kid comes in, looked like the picture that Cashy showed with uh, Bullis and Patigo, put him on keflex. I, I felt really smart. <laughs> you Probably finally like got that one right. Two weeks huh? later, I'll forget. Then I wonder, like, how often have I missed this? But have you seen? Yeah. Uh, I have, and actually, I, 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 I hope to think I'm one of the four percent that actually gets this. But, uh, but yeah, it's a tricky one. But, but, and, but it really doesn't look like anything else. Yeah. Right. And, it's impressive um, looking. It is. It is very impressive. So, the other one second diagnosis was eczema herpeticum, which I know we've both seen over the years, and this is a wicked worsening of eczema with associated vesicles. It can be easily misdiagnosed as empatigo, and I think that that yep. probably we're, we've both been guilty of, right? Yep. And get treated with antibiotics, which can delay the treatment and worsen the situation because this is typically effectively treated with an antiviral like acyclovir or valacyclovir, which is also known as Valtrex. And certainly, you, if it goes near that eye, there it could be oh, devastating. Oh, yes. Any question that, with that, right to the ophthalmologist. Off the ophthalmologist. So a related pearl to take from this is that if a child keeps getting, quote, empatigo over and over again in the same place, it's probably a herpes or varicella viral infection being reactivated. And lastly, Dr. Oza discussed acne. We have devoted a few episodes to this in the past, episodes 44 and 45 back in early 2020, but we always want to learn more about what the specialists do, right? It makes us look like we know, we know more, something, <laughs> know something right. right? And can you believe this is our 60, 63rd episode, Matt? Wow. I know. I don't know what that How means. How many listeners do we have? Like 10? <laughs> <laughs> over a Up thousand. From four. <laughs> over a thousand. Over a thousand per episode. So I always think like if I went into a room and a thousand people were listening to me, I, I'd feel pretty good. Goodness. So some highlights um, about acne. First of all, the idea of food causing acne like the idea that foods are a major cause of eczema, is generally overblown, but has some truth to it. It's true that Pacific Islanders and hunter-gatherer cultures have little or no acne. So diet plays a role, genetics plays a role. In the United States, 85% of teenagers develop some version of acne. And high glycemic diets that are high in certain types of sugar definitely seems to increase the risk for acne as does consumption of low-fat milk. And we've talked before about low-fat milk also being potentially tied to an increased risk of obesity. So stay away from low-fat. I'm talking about skim or 1% pretty much. Now, 
Of course, retinoids are the first line in treating anything more than mild acne. They help reduce sebum production or the oil and decrease keratinization of the skin follicles, so, so help decrease the clogging of the pores. They also decrease inflammation. The only thing that retinoids do not do is decrease the amount of bacteria on the face that spurs acne. But this can be accomplished by other things like benzoyl peroxide and sometimes antibiotics. Combination oral contraceptive pills also decrease sebum oil production, as does the drug spironolactone. Antibiotics can also decrease inflammation independent of their antibacterial skills. So I got I'm proud of this, Matthias. I started to prescribe birth control pills for my patients after being tutored by nurse practitioner extraordinaire at Nemours, Christine DePaulo, which I got from one of her talks at Hot Topics at Disney, but also talking to my practice NPs, Kay and Tina and Heather. You've got great NPs in your office. We do. I find that they're really good at birth control pills. Oh, yes, pills. they are. Um, the first time I did it myself after 30-something years was last month. Um, I prescribed Yaz, which is a good choice if decreasing acne is one of the main reasons you want to do it. So you can teach a very old dog uh, some new tricks. Do you prescribe birth control pills de novo much? Not often. I uh, Usually it's only because the nurse practitioner or one of my uh, female partners is out. And I'm just okay. like, okay, oh, what did okay. they get last time? I'll refill this, right? Um, but I did feel I'd, I have prescribed it more recently for a young lady with um, PCOS and some pretty bad acne. So we were kind of killing two birds with one stone, and it really worked fabulously well. And you started it from the beginning, mm-hmm. not your NP. I did. Yeah. I'm proud of you. Yeah. First one. It, it sounds like just doing it. 28 like, years. Just like the first uh-huh. time we started doing um, antidepressants which you never yes, used to do. absolutely. It's like that, once yeah. you get over that hump, like, okay, now I'm yeah. going. I mean, you also have to kind of <laughs> feel like you know what you're doing, too, right? <laughs> well, well, let me draw this. Uh-huh. Well, you do the research, uh-huh, and indeed. then we do the research. That's exactly what we exactly. do. Okay. So, uh, so this is Dr. Oz's approach to acne. For barely perceptible acne, he recommends using just benzoyl peroxide or topical retinoid at night. He uses Neutrogena Clear Pour or CeraVe Acne Foaming Cream Cleansers or Panoxyl Wash. Which these are his choices for benzoyl peroxides. The retinoid, Adapalene 0.1% gel, has now been sold over the counter for a couple of years, and its brand name is different. It's so much less expensive than it was when it was a prescription only. So what, you, what is it, Rob, like 16 bucks or something like that? It used to be hundreds. Right, except, right? Mm-hmm. except though, sometimes you have good insurance. It's even cheaper than yes, that, so it depends that's on the insurance. another weird insurance hitch right, there, right? right? So Dr. Oza mentioned that Adapalene plus benzoyl peroxide each night may be the best combination. And this is essentially the equivalent to the prescription combination that we know as Epiduo. And that's my go-to for, you know, anything more than mild is a generic uh, Epiduo. For mild to moderate acne, you can increase the strength of the retinoid, or you can add a topical antibiotic like clindamycin solution or gel, or perhaps switch to Tazerac, which is in the family of retinoids that are often used for psoriasis and something that I never use. Do you ever use Tazerac? I uh, see it, but I've not prescribed not it. Not often. Yeah. And there's mm-hmm. so many different choices for prescription um, topicals in the acne toolbox. Uh, the tretinoin um, retinoid, 0.025%, then 0.05%, then 0.1%. The adapalene, 0.1%, then 0.3%. Again, that Tazerac at... Um, 0.05% and 0.1%, and something called triferrotene, which is a new fourth-generation topical tretinoin, which seems to have better absorption and less irritation. Topical antimicrobials include the clindamycin 1% gel or solution, minocycline 4% foam, and there are combinations of antibiotic topicals and retinoids together and benzoyl peroxide. They have fancy names. They can be very expensive. Mm-hmm. I haven't used them myself much, but I know some of the dermatologists use them when they come in my office and show me what they have. Right. Yeah. But, uh, but hold the presses because there's a new topical anti-androgen therapy, Clax. Can you pronounce this one wrong? Class Coderon. There you go. Or Win Levy. Win sounds, Levy. That sounds like Win Dixie, right? <laughs> <laughs> that can be used in both girls and boys over 12, and especially if it seems to be a hormonally driven uh, acne, like with hirsutism, kind of like a topical spironolactone. And the use of oral spironolactone has steadily increased over the years in girls, and you can stay on it for a long time with similar success to oral antibiotics. 
Dr. Oza made the point that pediatricians definitely can prescribe oral spironolactone for girls. You start at 50 milligrams per day for two weeks and then increase to 100 milligrams per day, and the range is anywhere between 100 to 200 milligrams per day. There's no need to monitor labs in healthy children, and side effects can be irregular menses, breast swelling or tenderness, and dizziness, but they are not common. Have you prescribed that right there, Dr. Bob? Okay. Don't call me Bob. <laughs> okay, Bobby. Second, mm-hmm. uh, I have not prescribed spironolactone, although we could, And mm-hmm. uh, but then I heard about this Winlevy, which is the same stuff and maybe topical. Mm-hmm. That just sounds like it would be much more attractive uh, yeah. than the oral if it's not too expensive. Mm-hmm. Now, if acne progresses despite topicals, then oral antibiotics can be next. The classic is doxycycline, 100 milligrams twice a day, or alternatives like minocycline and Bactrim. There's a new generation of tetracycline called seracycline or Sacera that's once a day with possibly less GI upset and photosensitivity than the others. But again, remember that the new guidelines stress that you really want to limit oral antibiotics to no more than three months at a time and never ever using it as solo practices. I think we've talked before that both of us would see kids on doxycycline from the dermatologist for years and years, oh, years. and years and years oh, yeah. by uh-huh. itself. Like, oh, where are you getting it? Just right. getting uh-huh. for the dermatologist. Yeah, just, I just call for the refill. But mm-hmm. they really are not doing that uh, anymore. Yeah. Um, we talked about skin of color uh, with eczema that you can uh, miss uh, it often. Um, but also for acne, there's certain changes also. Skin of color acne often has more papules and comedones and more hyperpigmentation or darkening with less inflamed pustules. And subclinical inflammation can lead to this hyperpigmentation. But specifically, it seems that visible light plays a much more important role in causing this hyperpigmentation in darker skin. So when treating acne in those with darker skin, you should really push tinted mineral sunscreens. Um, Brands like Tizo, Coats, and CeraVe. I didn't know that. Did you know that? I did not know that. Kazi then also touched on hydradenitis. I never can get this one. Hydradenitis superativa. We'll just say HS. I don't know about you, Matt, but I've been seeing a lot of HS over the last few years. Have you? I haven't seen a lot, but I am guilty of having misdiagnosed a kid with this one of those classic things, recurrent uh, abscesses at the groin, right? right? Right. But the second or third time somebody comes back with something that's already a little unusual, you start to think, "Mm, maybe I'm off base here. And then I did some research. I'm like, ah, you have have HS. The thing Rob just said. (laughs) You have HS. 25% of those with HS report that it starts before puberty, and 50% have a family history. It's six to one female. Comorbidities include obesity and 65% and mood and anxiety issues and 22%. And most of my patients with HS have been overweight, female, older teens with some mood or anxiety. So it kind of fits right in there. And you look for these abscesses in hot spots like the waistline, infrapanus, under the breasts, the buttocks, the genitals, the inner thighs, and especially in the axilla. And you can look for past scarring and hyperpigmentation in those areas and even open comedones. It progresses from stage one with some isolated abscesses to stage two with recurrent abscesses and sinus tracts and scarring, and then stages with multiple abscesses and scarring over that entire anatomic region. Yeah, it's, a, it's, a, it's a miserable condition. So here's the HS pearl uh, that was given to us by Dr. Oza about diagnosing HS with two simple questions. Two questions. Have you ever had boils during the past six months? That's the first one. And then the second one, where and how many do you have? Have there been two or more in intertriginous areas? Yes. If the answer to both is yes, it has a 90% sensitivity and a 97% specificity for HS. So your patient, with those two questions, it would have been yes. Indeed. And you would have said, yeah. that has HS. So it's really simple. Fine. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So in patients with HS, screen for hyperandrogenism if under eight years of age, and also for PCOS, depression, and inflammatory bowel disease. Lifestyle modifications that help include weight loss and healthy eating, loose-fitting clothes, plus avoiding smoking and avoiding shaving. 
Alternatives are just trimming or laser hair removal. And again, especially in the groin area, especially in the armpits, and the shaving really is, is a problem for these uh, um, um, young people. He made the point that we pediatricians can usually manage HS with topical clindamycin 1% twice a day, plus benzoyl peroxide 5% wash, or chlorhexidine washes, um, oral antibiotics sometimes to prevent it can be doxycycline once or twice a day for two to three months. The biologic Humira has been approved for severe HS in over uh, 12 years of age, but he intimated, I think we both agree, that if you have HS, you should see a dermatologist early on, too. This can be a lifelong thing, and yeah. you want to have a dermatologist uh, involved. Yeah, as soon as I realized what was going on with this young man, I said, uh, get thee to a dermatologist. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. So finally, Maddie, then came the epic, epic, hot controversy debate, me against Kashi Oza, should pediatric caregivers prescribe isotretinoin or Accutane? 10% of teens have severe acne, and nothing works better than Accutane for moderate inflammatory acne with scarring or nodular cystic acne. It has over 85% cure rate through the first months. But remember, if you have someone Accutane, initially it can get worse. And that is called, I love the name, the Accutane Purge. purge. Have you heard of that? I have you not. You get worse? Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so just warn people about it. Yeah, uh, family practitioners, OBGYNs, oncologists, pediatricians, and nurse practitioners and physician's assistants in most states can register on iPledge and prescribe isotretinoin or Accutane. The big risk, as we all know with Accutane, is for someone who could become pregnant, is if they become pregnant, is birth defects. There is 20 to 30% risk of birth defects and about the same amount with spontaneous um, abortion. So Rob argued that pediatricians should prescribe Accutane or isotretinoin, and Dr. Oza said no. It quickly became clear that Dr. Oza was more keen on having pediatricians do it than Rob actually he really, was. <laughs> he really, as I did research on this for the media, I'm like, I don't want to do this. Many details were given about the iPledge program that was introduced in 2006 and really can be quite onerous with its personal repetitive monthly questions. Plus, the websites and databases can be a little bit clunky, and some studies show it really has not reduced the amount of pregnancies while someone was on Accutane, which are about 250 a year. They continue to be about 250 a year. Now, those with childbearing ability can just say, I choose to pledge abstinence and don't have to be on birth control. However, not surprising, the most common scenario for someone on Accutane to get pregnant is that they've chosen abstinence and they just didn't do it instead of just being on two forms of birth control. Um, it obviously is so much easier to prescribe this for those who cannot bear a child because you can just do some baseline labs and you can give it. It's no big deal. But if they can potentially have children, you need to get a pregnancy test. is a very tight window for getting the test in and then using it to the pharmacy and the I Pledge program. It's, it's really a pain. However, if you do prescribe it, the monitoring isn't really that much. Um, just a couple blood tests over the four to six months um, are needed. And I went over the side effects. The most common side effect is that everything becomes dry, dry, dry. Their mouth, their eyes, their nose. If you ain't dry, you're not taking uh, the Accutane. You've seen these kids, right? They're using lip balm. They're using eye drops. Everything gets really dry. Um, after I talked, then Dr. Oza described the very, very scary condition called acne fulminans that can happen mostly in boys when the acne explodes in Accutane and they need to be treated with steroids. Oh, often you can still keep the Accutane going, but it's very impressive. So as I said, by the time I finished the debate, I really didn't want to prescribe Accutane. And when I got home from Florida, like two weeks later, I saw a kid on Accutane and he got acne fulminans, this young man. And oh my gosh, it was just horrific. He was on steroids and such, but I'm thinking like, I'm glad I'm not the one who's doing that. So uh, I don't know about you. Do you want to prescribe Accutane? You know, I, I wouldn't mind. And really only for the cases where I really think that a, that a person could benefit from them. And I say, you know, you should. if I were you, I'd really see a dermatologist about this. There's good treatment for it. 
and then they just don't go. You know, I feel like that's that, that was a lost opportunity wherein like, okay, I know and I trust you, but do I really want to go see somebody? And eh, it's not that bad. You know, that kind of thing. But that's the uh-huh. thing about it. Like in those mm-hmm. particular cases or in boys. Yes. But if you don't do this a lot, it's yes. really onerous. No, no, I, I Your absolutely Your whole practice, get it. it's yeah. very onerous. Yeah. So I, I don't know that I would do it, but I think I would, I would yeah. consider it. Yeah. All right, well... Yeah, so 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 I do think more adolescent med- medicine specialists could could put themselves in a position to do this. Again, I we just said how hard it was. I'm right. foisting Although that on a them. Few, a few uh-huh. adolescent medicine people at the at the meeting came mm-hmm. up afterwards and said, "I'm going to start doing this." So yeah, there you go. You're right. Yeah, mm-hmm. I think that is very appropriate. All right. Well, that's it for now, gang. Uh, next episode is on asthma. Anything else to add there, uh, Roberto? Say good night. Good night and go, Ferds. <laughs> good night. <laughs>